and welcome all of you to the first of five sessions that we're going to have around a health sciences workshop series this week. The first on the agenda is preparing for the data management tri-agency policy and focusing on how to develop a data management plan. My name is Kevin Reed, and I am a health sciences librarian here at the university. I have been providing data management support throughout my entire career, uh, both here at the university as well as before when I worked at NYU and I worked for the NIH before looking at how to help researchers both manage and share their research data. So we're going to focus a lot on that today, specifically within the confines of what the tri-agency is going to expect of you with this new data management policy. I'll stop at various times throughout the session to make sure there's time for questions, and we'll have time at the end as well to discuss those too. So let's go ahead and get started. So the focus of today is really to help you understand and be able to describe how you can apply data management practices to all stages of your research, to explain the incoming policy requirements around research data management, to outline the steps involved in building a plan, and then also where to find help for RDM or research data management on campus. So I wanna start really quickly to make sure we're all on the same page, is what do I mean by what I'm asking about research data management? So I'm gonna turn that question on to you first. And when you hear the word data management or research data management, what's the first thing that comes to mind? So if you're willing to share in the chat, what are some of the things that come into your mind when you hear data management? Security, okay. Sharing data with others, storing data, okay, perfect. Anybody else wanna have a go? First thing that popped into your head, redundancy. Ooh, interesting, Blake. I like that one. I want to know more about what you mean by that. Okay. So we have a few ideas here. Security, storage, redundancy, and we're going to talk a lot about that today. So just to make sure we're on common ground, I want to start off with a clarification is what do I mean when I'm saying research data? And what does the tri-agency mean when they're talking about research data? And that's any information that you're collecting, that you're generating, that you're processing, that you're using to validate your research findings. Really, the, the, it's the data or the information that serves as the basis of your arguments or your conclusions, whether you're publishing or giving a presentation or writing a report. And what research data is, is really highly context specific or discipline specific. So what research data looks like to you might look very different to someone else in this room. I know we're all working in the health sciences, but even whether you're working in a research bench, bench science lab or you're working in a clinical setting, the data is going to look very different. We can also distinguish between different types of data. So primary data being those that are collected firsthand. And really what, I'm, what I mean by that is that it's original or new data. And so examples of that might be the number of adverse drug reactions in a clinical trial or interview recordings that are gathered from a rural community. Whereas secondary data is actually been already collected that you are reusing for a new research project or to ask a new research question. And often this is being used for reanalysis. And examples of this might be census data, hospital registry data, or someone else's primary data, right? So I may collect data that may be of interest to you that you can repurpose and ask new research questions of and explore on your own. We can then think about data in terms of the types of data by stage. So raw data would be data that is, exists at the point of collection. It's the first time you've collected it. It's in its rawest form. Usually it's completely unaltered. And again, as I mentioned in the last slide, raw data can also be considered someone else's secondary data. Process data is any data that has been transformed or altered in some way. That might be data that you're creating or subsetting to do some analysis on. It might be you're removing all the identifiers from the original data set in order to be able to use it in a way that protects patient privacy. And then finally, analyzed data is all of the actual calculations or the analysis you've done on that process data. So I just want you to think about the fact that data comes in different stages and someone's raw data may be someone else's analyzed data or process data. And so it comes in many different shapes and forms. And for your own context, thinking about your own research, I want you to consider what would be considered raw in your case 
versus something that's processed versus that's analyzed. So when we think about data in that sense, what do we mean then by research data management? So many of you mentioned security and storage and sharing. And really what data management is, is the planning, the maintenance, and the documentation of all aspects of your research data throughout the course of a study or a project. So if you are doing active data management, you should be organizing and keeping track of your data, under, being able to understand and use your data, not only today, but three years from now or five years from now. The ability to preserve your data so it's actually usable in the future, and to share and facilitate reuse of your data when possible. And we're gonna talk about that as well today. So really the focus of data management is around research transparency. So as you start a research project all the way to the time that you finish and you're publishing, data management is there to help provide clarity for someone else as well as for yourself to go back and see all the work that you did. And so just as a comparison sake, I like to show this slide where when we read a publication or we're reading a journal article from published research, we're really only getting the tip of the iceberg. Sure, we can see how the data was analyzed and we get a narrative description of the methodology as well as the analysis, but so many other aspects of what we did with our data comes into play that we don't see in an article itself. And that's really where data management happens. And so below the surface of the water, when we think about it in this particular analogy, you have your study protocols. Maybe you have a data collection plan. Maybe you're using specific types of instruments or software, and that isn't always reported in an article. And so what data management is trying to do is to bring all of these types of things up to the surface so our research is more easy to understand and it's more reusable by someone else who might want to explore it further. So why does data management matter, especially right now? What's really the driving force be behind why data management is becoming such a hot topic here? And, and the reason, and I, I suspect one of the main reasons why a lot of you are here today is because it's now becoming a requirement from the tri-agency. So the requirements that are coming out that are basically starting um, in this year, 2023, is that any grant proposal submitted to the agencies should include methodologies that reflect data management best practices, Every single grant will require data management plans to be submitted at the time of application, and they're actually going to be considered in the adjudication process. So that's what's happening right now, and that's what the expectation is going to be. What we know is coming later is that probably in 2024, 25, they haven't announced it yet, is that grant recipients will eventually be required to deposit research data that support the conclusions in journal publications and preprints. So the data should be findable in some way. I'm going to talk about this later. This does not mean that you will be required to share your data. I want you to remember that now because normally when I show this slide and I show later slides, people get really upset because they think that they're gonna to have to share their data no matter what. And that's not the case, but what they're trying to focus on here is that your data can actually be found by someone and whether they have to go through ethics approval or get community approval, there is a way for them to find, understand, and access your data in some way. So we know that already the tri-agency is testing this out. So there are currently pilot programs underway from the CIHR, from NSERC and SHRC. And the first round of these is actually the deadline is, is right now in winter of 2023. And the goal of these pilots is specifically to help understand the pay po pain points researchers like you have with actually working through a data management plan and, and recording all this information and making it easy for people to understand. And so the experience with this is to get a better sense to help support you going forward and to help us at the institution be able to support you as well. And so we can see the data management language is changing. And this is what the tri-agency is using in the policy requirement. They see it as a necessary part of research excellence. They're saying that research data collected through the use of public funds should be responsibly and securely managed. There's that word security again, and where ethical, legal, and commercial obligations allow, available for reuse by others. So it's publicly funded. The tri-agency wants to see that data available if it's ethically and legally possible. And so why is this becoming such an important thing? And really, there's a lot of factors that are coming into play. The first is that we are starting to see a trend in the fact that many research results that are published in the scholarly literature are not reproducible. 
So reproducibility means the ability for me to go and, and see what you did and read what you did and follow the same steps and ideally come to similar outcomes that you did. But what we're finding from a lot of studies that are coming out is that the large majority of research cannot be reproduced. And the main reason is a lack of transparency, incomplete level of reporting, and poor documentation. People just don't have enough information to be able to follow the steps and truly validate or ascertain whether or not research can be reproducible in this way. We also know that as soon as an article is published, that data starts to lose value. And there's many reasons behind that. Maybe somebody puts it on a USB stick and throws it into their drawer. Maybe they're just not thinking about it or it's saved in a strange format and they're not thinking about its usability in the long term. But there have been studies that show as soon as an article is published, the data underlying that article starts to lose its value and its utility as it goes on. And we know this is a particular issue in Canada. So this is a study that I ran a couple of years ago where we looked at all examples of CIHR researchers or research funded papers that said they shared their data. And so of all of those articles where we could find data sets that were shared, only 13% of them included any documentation that would allow you to reuse it. So even though the, the examples and the sample we looked at were examples of people who could share publicly and did, we couldn't use over 80% of it because of it. And so the, the tri-agency sees this and research generally sees this because we're starting to throw out a lot of useless data in this way. And so ideally what data management is trying to do is to avoid this scenario, right? My project is over. I didn't think about my data at all or about the process, or I did it in a, in a scramble because I was applying for grants and I was trying to get published. And if someone else came to you and asked for some help with their data, you'd say, here it is, good luck, and try to navigate through it. And so the idea here with data management is it's going to help you think about and process what's happening in your research project and documenting it throughout the course of, of that work. So. I'm just going to take a pause here for a second to take a sip of water. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. So let's look at how we can actually impart data management across the life cycle of research. So as I mentioned, data management is focused on transparency. And so we can think about at every stage of the life cycle, we're developing a lot of stuff. Right, We have a research question, maybe we're developing a study protocol, we're thinking about data analysis and how we're actually going to analyze our data, we're using software to collect our data, maybe we're transferring it from different programs, we're transforming our data based on what we want to put into figures that we want to publish into our, our, our papers, and all of that is important for understanding where our data comes from and how it's managed accordingly. And so what I like to show is this data management rubric, which shows you sort of the four categories of researchers and how they might approach data management at various stages of the process. This is from a good colleague of mine at Stanford who, who developed this, and I find it's a great way to self-assess where you currently sit in terms of how you provide data management support. So most people, when they're not thinking about data management, and I think is most common based on my experience, fall into this category. So they're doing it ad hoc, right? You don't really have a plan, but you feel generally pretty good about how you're organizing your data. Or maybe you've done a really good job one time because a, an author reached out to you or someone read your paper and said, this is really great. Can I see the data and can we collaborate? And now you have to get up to speed and make sure everything looks good so it can be reused for future research. So ideally what the tri-agency wants to do and what research is trying to move towards more broadly is getting people to think about being active and informative or optimizing your data for reuse. So when you're planning your project, you're not having your own way of doing things. Rather, you're creating and managing a system that's designed to be used by others. So think about that from your perspective. And what I'd like to do just for a second is for you to take a look at this slide and consider which category aligns closest with your current research practices. If you're feeling generous and brave, you can enter into the chat what you feel you're categorized as. But I want you to just take a minute and look at this slide and see where you fit now and potentially what the next level would be for improving your data management going forward. 
So if anyone feels brave enough to put in where they feel they fit into the chat, please do. And I'll just give us 30 minutes to uh, 30 seconds to a minute to to consider that and for you to read through this. I will say when I first started, I was definitely ad hoc. And now I would say I'm probably more active and informative and sometimes optimized for reuse. Thanks, Lynette, for sharing. I really appreciate that. Okay, I'll just give everyone a couple more seconds to read through this and process it. Okay. So at least now, whether you've shared or not, you have a sense of where you are now and, and whether you feel good or not. And now you can compare what I'm going to show you as to what good data management looks like. So what you can do really across the life cycle to apply data management to your research. Thanks everybody, I appreciate your feedback there. Okay. So ideally, when you're thinking about data management, it should be happening right away. So you've got your research question, you're thinking about starting your research, this is when data management happens. Because ultimately, it lays the groundwork for how you're going to do your work across the entire process. So what does that mean? What does good data management look like in practice and how can you apply it in a relatively easy way? So my goal today is really to show you some easy tips that you can use to apply data management and fulfill the requirements of the tri-agency at the same time. So really good data management practices falls into six relatively simple buckets. And the first one we're gonna talk about is a data inventory. So what a data inventory is, is really a chance for you to take a step back and really think about what is it that you're creating over the course of your project? What does it look like? And what do you need to do or need to understand in order to use it? So the questions are typically, what types of data are you collecting? What are the file types you're creating? And we'll talk about why file types are important a little bit later. How stable is the data? Are, is it being updated every night? Is it being updated only once? Does it change a lot or a lot of people touching it at the same time? This is important because a lot of times I see data loss issues because there aren't necessarily good roles identified in terms of how people approach the data and people overwrite data or delete data without even realizing they've done it. How much data you expect to generate is going to inform where you might store it. And then finally, and probably the most important part of this is what other information is necessary for me to understand the data? So is it a protocol? Is it a data collection instrument? Is it software requirements? Is it a lab notebook that you have stored in your lab? All of these things are going to inform the data itself so that it's not standing in isolation as a data set, it has a lot of other information around it. And so here you can see an example of what my data looks like for research that I'm doing. I pull a lot of publication data from PubMed to study how researchers share their data. I also gather data about data sharing procedures. I collect different types of files, and once it's, it's collected once, I don't update it again. And usually it, it falls around one to three gigs. So it's easy for me to figure out where I'm going to store it. And in terms of the other data necessary to understand it, I have my study protocol. I have a data dictionary, which we'll talk about. I have an analysis plan. I have the read-in files I use to analyze it in SAS, and so which is a statistical program. So it's just to give you an idea of the different types of things I think would be important if you had my data that you would also need to know. So really a data inventory is a very simple way for you to get a full breadth landscape of all the pieces of information you need to, to go forward with data management. The next part really gets to that last question in the data inventory, which is what else would be understandable or needed to understand my data? And that's documentation. And so what documentation means here is really a chance for you to provide transparency for how you collected, processed, or analyzed your data. It's also going to support the preservation of your data because if you go back to a data set five years from now, I know that I wouldn't remember what I did five years from now. And so the documentation helps you read 
what it was you did and how, how you did it so it's easier to understand. And ultimately, documentation is the key driver for reuse. Without documentation, you can't reuse the data. So when you're thinking about building documentation, here are some questions I encourage you to ask yourself. Would someone else not affiliated with my research be able to understand how I collected, processed, or analyzed this data set? Would your data make sense to somebody else if they came across your files in the wild? So let's say they're looking on Google and your data set comes up because you happen to share it. Would they be able to understand what it was and its context? Would it be linked to a publication? That's the kind of thing you want to be thinking about. And again, as I said, if you went back five to 10 years from now, would you be able to pick it up and keep using it again? So really important facts. And so what I'm going to, to suggest here are ways that you can help build good documentation going forward. And so one of the best things you can do is to create a data collection plan. So many times a, a study protocol will satisfy the, this requirement, but oftentimes a study protocol doesn't get down to the detail that really explains what you've done step-by-step step in a process of collecting data specifically. And so on the left-hand side here, we have an example of a readme text file that I created that really shows how I collected the data and deduplicated it. On the right-hand side, this is something I've encouraged a lot of labs to do, research labs, where they actually draw a diagram step-by-step step of their process. So it helps them visually understand what they're doing at each stage. So <clears throat> whether they're collecting a particular sample or analyzing that sample or, or what type of software they're using, it's all pulled into a diagram. So I want you to think about your own research if you're working on research right now and think about what a data collection plan might look like. But really it's a chance for you to really get into the detail about what you're doing with data collection. The next thing is really, is your data set, so let's say it's tabular data in a spreadsheet, is it actually understandable or easy to interpret? So this is actually a spreadsheet from a researcher I used to work with at NYU who allowed me to share this as an example of what not to do, is if you were to come across this spreadsheet with no other documentation, you would have no idea what it was about. I don't know what P1 means or P4. I don't know what the values of one through four mean. I don't know what active means or strong means. And so ultimately, whenever you're working with tabular spreadsheet data, you should be thinking about how can I make this understandable to somebody else? And where that comes into play is the data dictionary. So if you don't have something like this, really what it is is a simple guide for what are the variable names or the column headers in my spreadsheet? What do they mean if they're acronyms? How are the values represented? Are they text? Are they multiple choice? What does each number affiliated with? And what are the units of measure? I have seen so many times where, because there's no data dictionary, people have misinterpreted data, have worked with data inconsistently, and it's cre created a lot of headaches. And so a dictionary essentially serves as a guide for any spreadsheet that you might create. Another simple or complex way that you could do this is to create readme files. So really those are meant for quick reference and it's generally a, a simple file that you would put into a folder that would describe what the data set was, how it was collected, any other relevant information that would help you understand it and a contact person, right? So someone who would actually help you with that data if you needed support. And so I've put a link here to a template for a readme file on the right-hand side and you can see an example of what I've done in, in the past to help you understand how a readme file might look like. If you wanna go even further, a lot of people who are sharing large complicated data sets will actually create a full user guide to and really thinking about the user in mind. So it might be three to five pages of information about how to input a data set or what software you need to use and how to run the files. And so there's a variety of levels here in terms of the level of data management you wanna provide. Maybe you don't want to create a user guide because you don't plan to share the data publicly, but for yourself, it would be great to have a simple file that explains what a data set is and when it was collected and how it was collected. So really, the idea of data management is really on you to think about how much effort do you want to put in and how much value does it pull out for you as you work through the process. 
If you want to go the extra mile, you can consider adding in metadata. So by metadata, I mean, really it's data about data. Um, and so in this case, you can see on the left-hand side, we have project level documentation, which will give you a standard documentation for how you would in provide information about your project. If you have quantitative data, the types of questions you might want to provide and qualitative data. And all metadata does is provide you with structured fields to make your data easily understandable so that if you want to share it or reuse it, it's easy to follow and use. Okay. Before I move on to file organization, are there any questions or comments about that? Okay. So think about metadata and user guide as the optimized for reuse column of that original table I showed you where we decided where we did our self-assessment, whereas a readme file might be a one-time or active and informative. So it's really about the level of detail you're going to provide. So now we get into the topic of file organization, which may seem mundane, but is honestly probably the primary source of pain in terms of finding data, figuring out what the data is, and data loss that I've seen in my career so far. And so I, I like to show this idea of file naming and what's important here, but the pro tip of this slide is never look in somebody else's folder because as they create files, they're not necessarily thinking about how they're doing so, so that it's easily retrievable and understandable for others. And so just some really basic good practices on the file naming front. Basic rules are to use letters, numbers, and underscores only. Don't use any special characters. I've had the case where I used special characters in OneDrive before, and overnight it created 175 copies of the same file without me knowing it. And so oftentimes we, some programs are going to accept strange characters and some won't. But ultimately, if you only use letters, numbers, and underscores, it's going to make it a lot easier to use on any platform. And generally, we recommend that you follow a simple st structure. So the project name, the file name, a version if possible, and the date. And I've provided some data information here on the left-hand side. You also want to be descriptive, right? File.txt or unknown.475 isn't going to help you very much in figuring out how to sift through and find your data. Whereas good might be an example of the project, the contents, and when it was collected. And you wanna be consistent. So once you have a plan, the more consistent you can be, the easier it is to find, sort, and organize your data. And so it's really important that you consider the human readability of your, of your files and the machine readability. Because if it's not all consistent and you put it into a program, it might get lost somewhere else. So always focus on being consistent in this way. You also want to think about version control. So if you are creating hundreds and hundreds of files because you're running the same experiment over and over again, you want to think about how it's going to be sorted, right? So on the left-hand side, I didn't account for the fact that I might have 100 data sets. And so the data actually sorts incorrectly. Whereas if I, if I know I'm going to be creating 50 to 100 data sets, I can leave some space there by adding zeros so it's going to sort properly. And when I gave this presentation last time, a researcher actually said they had this issue happen to them where they didn't account for this and it wrecked all their data when they pulled it into their statistical program because it didn't align properly and it made a giant mess. And it actually was reused multiple times before they realized there was an issue. So it seems like a really simple thing, but it has huge implications down the line. So file naming is a very simple way for you to manage your data accordingly. And then there's organization, right? Generally, we recommend one directory per project. You have a project folder, you keep your data sets that are raw versus analyzed separate so that it's easy to know who's working on what, you keep your methodology separate, so it's all organized and tracked in a simple way, and it's all managed accordingly that way. And so generally, when you're starting out, have a file naming plan before you start creating your data, because as soon as you start, it's over, right? You're just creating file names out of, without thinking about it, and you're putting them in a folder that you haven't thought about. And then when it comes time to write your paper, you're spending hours and hours trying to figure out where all those files are. 
another really easy thing to do is add a readme file to each folder that says this folder contains X information. And as I said before, separate your raw data from your process data as well. Okay. So once you have your file naming plan and your organization set up, now you can think about how are we going to store this data and how are we going to preserve it? And I'm not someone from IT, so if people have questions about storage afterwards, I'm happy to refer you or to try to answer them as well. Um, but I wanna go over the process of thinking about it from a data management perspective here. So ideally, before you start your project, you're gonna plan for where your data is going to live at different stages. So is it going to be in the same place when you collect your data versus when you analyze it versus when you publish it? So I've worked with a lot of people who collect data and use a certain type of software, like RedCap, for example. And then they export that data and send it to a statistician who stores it on their own drives. And then it comes back to me and I put it on one drive and then I'm working through it there and then publishing it. And so if you know where your data is at every stage, it's a lot easier for you to track what's happening and track the process. So once your data is being moved from one place to another, you already have an idea of what that looks like because you've planned for it ahead of time. And then finally, and really, really important here is who is responsible or who is your steward for your data at every stage? So a lot of times people will say, well, everybody's responsible for data management in my lab or on my team. But what happens when you say everyone's responsible for something? Does anyone want to take a guess in the chat? If everybody's responsible and no one's accountable, what ends up happening is nobody really does it. And so data management, especially from the tri-agency, exactly, Sylvia, thank you. The tri-agency wants to see who is responsible for this data at different stages. Is it the PI? Are you working with a, a research administrator who's working with the data or pushing it from one place to the other? Really, the idea of responsibility is, is one, to keep track of what's happening when, and also to hold people accountable. So just to show you what data storage and backup looks like at USAS, what I like about this particular table is it shows you where data can go depending on its level of sensitivity. So the ones I have highlighted here are specifically focused on where research data is typically stored. And so what we're seeing here is if you have data that's restricted, the only real place that you can share it here or save it on campus is in data store. Whereas if you have public sharing data, you have multiple options available to you. So I wanna show you this because you, it's important to know what's available to you at this institution in terms of where your data can go and to make sure that you don't have data in a place that maybe you're not supposed to. Also very, very important. Data storage does not equal preservation in any way. So just because my data is stored on this single USB drive and I put it in my desk drawer does not mean that it's preserved in any way. And so preservation is really more of a mindset on how you might approach data management from the very beginning. And so the first thing preservation does is protect your data from hardware obsolescence and software obsolescence. So on the left-hand side here, we have a picture of my former colleague's PhD thesis, which is on a jazz drive. Now, if she wanted to open this file and access her data, she would have to go onto eBay and hopefully find a machine that would allow her to use the jazz drive to open it. So ultimately, not very preserved, not very reusable, not very data management friendly. The same as it happened on the right-hand side where maybe you're using a specific kind of software that not everybody has, and then that software goes bankrupt or it becomes obsolete and you can't use it anymore. And you go back to your data five years later and you try to open it and this is what you get instead. And so what preservation is trying to do is make sure that you're thinking about what is the format this data is in? Is it going to be accessible and usable in the long term? And so one of the strongest recommendations I can make for you is to save at least one copy of your data, your rawest data, in an open format. So what you have here on the left-hand side are all the proprietary types of formats you might see. So Excel or Word, anybody who's tried to open a heavily formatted Excel file in Google Sheets, for example, might know the headache you might experience or any other type of program. And so what you can do to increase the preservation of your data 
is to save one copy in an open format. So a comma separated value file or a PDF or a plain text can be opened on any computer and it can be explored on any type of software program because they are standard open formats. And so what I usually recommend that you do is make one master data set of your rawest data in its rawest form, and then make as many copies or subsets as you want, whether it's in Excel or you put them in SPSS or you're looking at them in R. The important thing is that if you were to lose all of this Excel data or this SPSS data, you could always return back to that original data because it's there and stored in a preservation format that you can open on any type of program. So if Microsoft ever goes bankrupt, which is probably unlikely, but you never know, and I still find that when I open an Excel file from a few years ago, it doesn't quite work the same way as it does now. And so with a CSV file, I can import it, it's formatted in the same way, and it's easy to access. So really important tip here, and one of the things I always say is, think about how much data you can afford to lose. If it's zero, I would recommend definitely saving something in a preservation format. Somebody also mentioned when I asked about data management was the idea of backups. And so I highly recommend the 321 rule, which means keeping at least three copies of your data, storing two backup copies on different devices or storage systems, and keep one of those copies offsite. So I unfortunately have real world experience of this. When I worked at NYU, it was during the time when, if anyone remembers Hurricane Sandy, and a lot of researchers had their laptop their work computer, and all of that information stored in the lab, and all of it got flooded, and they lost years and years of data because of it. And they weren't using the institutional storage systems. So they had external hard drives, USB sticks, and laptops, all with storage of their data, all wiped away because it was in the same place. The same thing happens with theft, right? If you only have one external hard drive that you're carrying around in your backpack, and you go to the gym and someone takes it, that's your data forever. And so by using IT systems, your data is going to be backed up naturally. But also, if you leave the institution or you're sharing with someone else, it's always good to think about making copies on a regular schedule and saving that data and keeping one at home and one at work, if possible. Can't stress that enough because it's heartbreaking to see people suffer that much data loss. And then finally, again, I'm just going to remind this and really, really pound this home in terms of its importance. Documentation is key to preservation. So those protocols, those readme files, that data dictionary is essential for preservation because otherwise there's no way for us to understand the data at all. So that really helps with that process. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about ethical and legal data stewardship. And what this means really, especially in the context of a data management plan, is for you to consider the questions about are there any ethical or legal restrictions that may influence how your data is collected, stored, and shared? And so this is a health sciences workshop series. I think we're all probably quite familiar with the idea of, of participant privacy and consent within our projects. And so a data management plan is really looking to see what are the types of procedures that you're are going to be required to follow in your study? Are, do you need ethics approval? Are you acquiring consent? Are you working with a specific community that says, that they get to dictate how the data is shared or reused. All of these types of things need to be in consideration in data management plan because it's going to guide how you do that research. So I showed you before the example of the data storage options by restriction level or by sensitivity, and you can see the same thing here. So you can see how in this section, and I'll share the slides afterwards, what class of data you, yours might fall into. So what's considered restricted at USASC versus what is considered public. And we know that for specific types of research now, when you're working with certain communities, there are new frameworks being developed in terms of how you might approach it from an ethical perspective. And so one of the primary examples of this is in terms of indigenous data stewardship and governance, which is specifically called out in the tri-agency policy. And so if you are ever working with indigenous populations, there are now actual frameworks and guidelines like the OCAP principles or the CARE principles, as well as a new Saskatchewan Métis health research and data governance principles that are going to help guide working with communities around making sure their data is secure 
and organized and, and distributed in a way that they are comfortable with. And so this is happening not only in Indigenous research, but across the board as data management becomes more prominent. And so our goal at the library is to make sure that you're aware of these types of frameworks that you can use for your research going forward. There are also many useful tools out there um, when collecting sensitive data. So the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, of which I'm a part, uh, has released a sensitive toolkit for researchers. So you can see the level of risk uh, that your participants have within a research project, as well as data management language specific for informed consent. So as you're developing consent guidelines, this information will be available to you as well. And really important here, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So whatever you're putting into your ethics application can also fit into your data management plan. You don't have to rewrite everything. It can literally be copy and pasted into a plan itself. So don't think that you have to do this again. One of our goals, again, and what the tri agency is trying to do is reduce the burden on you. So always make sure that you and remember that you can reuse a lot of the information you're already creating to put into your plan. So let's get to the last part of data management practices, which is really the data sharing considerations. And so starting in later 2023, 24, this is where the tri-agency is going to be expecting the deposit of research data that supports the conclusions in journal publications and preprints. And again, it's expected to provide appropriate access to the data where ethical, cultural, legal, and commercial requirements allowed. I, again, I'm putting this in red. You are not required to share data, but the expectation is, is that you should at least be trying to consider what you can share and how, and how that's tied to a publication. We've seen also an update to data sharing and consent in the TCPS2 form. I'm not um, an ethics expert, and so I'm not going to go into uh, much detail here, but I will say that there is a focus on the idea of data sharing in the new levels of broad consent for research. And so they want you to consider when you're building consent forms, how data sharing was going to be included. If you are someone who is interested in sharing your data publicly, there are a lot of places you can do so. The main place that USASC is likely going to recommend that you share your data is Canada's Federated Research Data Repository. It is a repository where you can upload any research data that you would like associated with a publication or standalone that you can get credit for. It's citable, it has a unique identifier, so it can be accessed in perpetuity online. If you would rather share data in a more discipline specific location, there is a registry called Re3Data, which is the logo on the right hand side, which allows you to search by discipline. So if you know your community is already sharing somewhere, it's worthwhile to look through that registry to see, maybe I should share my data there because that's where people are most likely going to access it. So when you're choosing a repository to share your data, <clears throat> always think about who owns or controls the data within the repository. You wanna make sure you're not putting your data somewhere like Elsevier, and all of a sudden they're selling your data back to the library or to the institution. You wanna think about the costs. Some, data, some repositories are free, others are not. And also thinking about, are you going to have to update the data? Are you going to, is it going to allow you to add new versions of data as you create it? Does it control access? So if it's restricted, does it provide you with the tools to do so? Is it going to be able to support large data sets? Is it going to preserve your data and back it up? Always really important to check before you, before you share. And can it connect your data with your publication? Which is obviously key because you wanna be able for someone to see your data set online and link directly to the publication where that data set was produced. So the benefits of this is that research data on its own is also a way to get credit for your research. And it's recognized in a lot of people's um, application processes, as well as we're seeing in hiring. If someone is sharing, if you've shared your data and people have reused it heavily, it goes towards credit in terms of showing academic output and significant impact in your work. And so here's an example of data that I shared many years ago that has been accessed and downloaded and recited many times. And it's a great way, and it's been a great way for me to show my own research impact in a way that's not a traditional publication. And for those of you attending the class tomorrow, it's really gonna focus on how to make all aspects of your research open and citable. Very important here to think about that 
data management and data sharing are synonymous. So this is an article from the New England Journal of Medicine that talks about data dumpsters and how a few years ago, when everyone was starting to share data, they were just sharing that spreadsheet with the P1, P2, P3 headings, and no one could use it. It was garbage. And so ultimately, useful data means your data is easy to find, it's easy to interpret, it's preservation friendly, there's documentation, and it's structured in a way that's easy to analyze or explore. Okay, I'm just going to pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions about what I've talked about so far, because the last bit here is, is really about putting it all together into the plan itself and some tools you can use to do so. So let me take a sip. Okay. Oh, I see a question. Okay, Asmahan, we'll, we'll, we can talk about that in a second. It's true, depending on how much data you can put in is important. And that's why that data inventory is key. Because if you have terabytes and terabytes of data, finding a place to store it can be extremely challenging. And so that should go into grant funding writing. It should be considered in the process itself. So we can talk in more detail after this particular section. So thank you for that. So really what a data management plan is at the end of the day is you taking all the pieces we just discussed and putting it in writing in some way. The guidelines for the tri-agency currently is that a data management plan should not exceed five pages. And so really it's you providing a concise and actionable way for you to manage your data over the course of the project. It serves really as a guiding document for your data. It's going to outline how it's collected, how it's analyzed, how your data is stored, what documentation you're using, how you're organizing your data, and then finally, making your data understandable for yourself and others. Many people now are sharing their data management plan as a supplementary file in their publication because it shows people the process that they went through and it provides that additional context. If you're still thinking about or having trouble conceptualizing what a plan is, really you can think about it as a blueprint for your data or a roadmap or a standard operating procedure. It's really a way for you to outline all the different aspects of your research using the tools and the strategies I talked about today. So you can either do that freehand in a document. You can open up a Word document and start writing in that information I talked to you about today, or there's existing software you can use to facilitate the building or creation of a data management plan. And so one of those is, and the main one that we're recommending people use is the DMP assistant. So DMP stands for data management plan. And ultimately it's a free software tool that allows you to create an account. It allows you to share your plans if you want to, but it takes you step-by-step step through all the types of questions I've asked you today. And so just to show you an example of that, here we have all the different phases of your research from data collection to documentation to storage and backup. And when you click on that, it's going to prompt you with questions to fill in information in a box. And at the end of that, you can export it as a PDF or as a Word doc or as a CSV file. And then you can upload that with any grant application you move forward with. And so the idea here is that rather than you create this on your own, it's giving you guided step-by-step -step questions that you can answer. So if you prefer something like this, it can be a really great way to get you started and structured. Some people have told me that they feel like it's a little too inflexible for them and they would prefer to do one on their own. So it's really up to you, but I highly encourage that you explore this tool because it might be an easy way for you to get started and to answer the questions you might not be thinking about related to data management. So just some things to take away, the, a data management plan is really considered a living document. So just because you might be creating one at the start of your project doesn't mean that that's the last time you're going to use it. So the idea here is that if your project changes or something in your data management process changes, the plan should change as well. So really the plan should be updated just like you were updating a method section or a protocol because it's there to guide the process and facilitate that process from the beginning of the project to the very end. And so what I wanted to conclude with here, just to give time for questions for everybody, is last year we held a summer program with faculty and their summer students, both graduate and undergraduate, 
And they went through the process of creating a data management plan from start to finish for that summer project. And this is some of the feedback that we received from that program. Uh, these are quotes from reflections that every student did at the end of the program. And generally people felt that just by sitting down, even if it was for an hour or an hour and a half to think about the actual process they were going to take before they did it, helped massively in terms of efficiency and organization of the research that they were doing. The other thing people mentioned a lot, which is the final quote here on this page, is that it really helped com improve communication across members of a team. So they worked with their supervisor, they were only a summer student, and it actually helped them with leaving information once the project was over with the faculty member so that they could translate that and onboard somebody new. So the idea here, a lot of challenges people face is that you have students coming in and out of a lab and you don't necessarily get to pick up that information, you have to start over. But data management actually helps facilitate that process and make it easier for people to leave and join a project because all that detail is there already. So with that, I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, if you're not aware that this is the first of five sessions that we're having this week, tomorrow will be specifically about open scholarship and how to make research more open from the very beginning of your project to the end. There's also going to be a session on open access publishing and how to reduce author fees for yourself, predatory journals, and then finally using our institutional repository, Harvest. There are a number of resources to help you get started, including our research data management guide um, and other tools that I mentioned today that you can explore, which are also on that guide. But for now, I'll thank everybody for their time. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and I'm, I'll stick around until 1 p.m. Um, but if not, thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it. You will receive some feedback, uh, a feedback form that we would love to hear from you about so we can continue to offer and improve these sessions going forward. So again, thanks everybody so much.